At the time I uploaded my last video, I had read about zero chapters of One Piece, but as of today, I'm at chapter 911, getting ready for the Wano arc, which is supposed to be the biggest and the greatest spectacle in the entire series. Every chapter I've read in the last month, I've done so against my will. It's like being stabbed in the stomach with different knives that have different variations of HIV in them, and I like it for some reason. I don't... <sighs> When I'm at work, I'm thinking about One Piece. When I'm with my girl, I'm thinking about One Piece. Hell, at the birth of my child, I was thinking about One Piece. From Shibandi, Archipelago to Marineford, I stayed up for 26 hours straight reading the entire thing. My mind was telling me no, but my body... My body is telling me yes. It was in this last month of torture and agony comparable to the victims of Guantanamo Bay that I realized that the greatest romance in the world isn't the one you share with the love of your life. She'll eventually leave you. It isn't your children, they're ungrateful. It isn't your parents, they killed your dreams. The greatest romance in the world is the search for the One Piece. What I love about One Piece is the highs, I love the lows, I love the cheers, I love the blows, I love the romance. Don, the name of the first chapter in the first arc of the series, which is a small contained story that acts as a striptease to the large adventure ahead. I guess you could say the dawn of a new day. It follows Luffy, a pirate who wants to be the king, and he's simply the most likable character I've ever seen in my life. A man so objectively likable that he makes you grin cheek to cheek just by the thought of his existence, as he meets his second in command, Zoro, who also has equally romantic aspirations to become the greatest swordsman in the world. Whereas all the other arcs in the series are named after their respective islands, it's the very first one, Roman Romance Dawn that names its arc after an idea rather than its setting. And that idea is the idea of romance, a feeling of excitement and mystery associated with love. And for most, that love is of another person. The girl next door, the boy in the football team, the mystery associated with not knowing if they like us back. The ecstasy when they're with us, the agony when they leave us, wanting to die because you miss them, can't take your hands off each other when you're with them. It's these tropes that showcase the beauty of romance, the gray area between love and lust, the euphoria of human connection. But eventually, the romance fades. The honeymoon period ends. After you spend so much time with your boo, after you know everything and beyond about the other person, after you've exhausted yourself from consuming every asset of their existence, their quirks, their flaws, their joys, their misery, you come back down to earth. The excitement has dampened, the mystery has faded, the romance is dead. All that's left, if you're lucky, is love. But the romance with the sea is endless. A restaurant floating on water serving pirates and marines on the same tables. An island of angels resting on the clouds in the distant sky. An island full of fish 10,000 feet under the ocean. A tropical island where half the population is toys. An island made entirely of creamy delicacies. And most importantly, an island with treasure so grand that you can't help but laugh. The world of One Piece is endless. There's never a dull moment because there's always something new to discover about this throbbing universe and many questions are rising with it. Why is there an endless bridge that's been under construction by a population of slaves for the past 700 years? What is a period of time 800 years ago that the world isn't allowed to know about that kickstarted the absolute power that the current government holds, the same power that enslaves anyone beneath them and wipes out entire islands that oppose them? Or even the meaning of our main character's initials, D, a name that's shared by some of the most tumultuous characters in the entire series, characters that are sometimes referred to as the natural enemies of God. But after 1,000 chapters of mysteries being teased and developed, we still don't know shit. Some of the shit I was just talking about was introduced 20 years ago real time. We don't even know who the enemy is. But the reason I decided to catch up to One Piece was because it's finally ending. In June, Oda announced that One Piece is entering its final saga, and that probably means this series is actually coming to a conclusion in the next couple years. And I want to experience the climax firsthand. Every mystery that's been set up, I want to see the answer in real time. I want the fruits of my reading to be justified, where everyone after reading the latest chapter collectively goes on Reddit to discuss theories and moments from the chapter. I want to see it through to the end like a little kid watching Roger's execution and his declaration that the One Piece exists. Maybe it'll move me in the same way that all those pirates are moved as well. Maybe I'm too early to experience the Day of Judgment. Maybe I'm too late to experience the beginning of the world. But at the end of One Piece, I'll be there. And at the center of that historic event will be one man. His goal, to become Pirate King. Not for the power, but for the freedom. The ability to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whomever he wants, for as long as he wants. True freedom. 
A character that's so selfless in diving headfirst into danger to save his friends, but so selfish in forcing them to join his crew. So stupid that he socks the literal god on earth in the mouth, knowing that it was practically a death wish from the repercussions, but so smart that he won't lay a hand on a man who pissed on his dreams. Because when you aim for the top, some fights just aren't worth fighting, you heard? The most romantic character in the most romantic story in fiction. The delusional hero that everyone longs to be but is too human to replicate. Monkey D. Luffy. But wait. Even before he ever enters the same realm of strength that someone wishing to become Pirate King must enter, it's just a regular day for the Straw Hats in their early adventures. Until... Rain? No. A ship falls from the sky. Everyone's freaked out because even in the world of One Piece, a ship falling from the sky is absolutely absurd. Especially a ship that's 30 times bigger than the one that the Straw Hats are currently sailing on. Luffy dives into the ensuing wreckage and finds a map of an island in the sky. Searching for a way to that sky island, the Straw Hats land on an island called Mock Town, which is a town surrounded by pirates. They ask around on how to get to an island in the sky and is laughed at by a pirate named Bellamy and his crew. An island in the sky? Are you stupid? The fools who go looking for their dream treasure cannot notice what's in front of them. In this era of the sea, the ones who lack real strength are the ones who are killed by their own imaginations. And then he beats their ass. However, Luffy and Zoro doesn't fight back. Because by all means in this situation, Luffy is being absolutely retarded. There is no scientific evidence that an island in the sky can exist. No records, no artifacts. It's just a map that might be fake in a ship that fell from the sky. There is absolutely nothing to back up his claims. His beliefs are delusional, whereas Bellamy's belief is based on reality, and almost always reality wins. But the reason why One Piece is the greatest love story of all time is that it argues that you need delusion to be a true romantic. To throw your fate at something that isn't 100%, for the things that you want to know, for the things that you need to do, you need to believe you can win, even if you mess up sometimes, or are hated by strangers, even if you completely ignore something that normal people would consider important, even if the world tells you it's bullshit, you need the will to dream. 300 years before astronomers were able to capture 4K images of planets in the distant sky, an astronomer named Johannes Hevelius drew pictures of the surface of the moon in great detail. Though he had telescopes set up in his house, none of them were advanced enough to truly seek out what the moon looked like on its surface, so Hevelius looked to his imagination to map the surface of the moon. What he came up with was a surface much like ours. Mountains and valleys, rivers and lakes, swamps and woodlands, islands and capes. This is what he imagined the surface of the moon to look like. And he wasn't the only one to have such romantic ideas about what the world beyond was either. There were many speculations of life on the moon and other planets by historians and astronomers before our time, all of which were romantic and, by extension, delusional. Lands filled with human bats, intelligent insects, utopias, advanced civilizations, but every single one of these turned out to be wrong, because science has proved that it's literally impossible for life to be sustained on the moon and all of the planets in the solar system. All that work and brainstorming that the astronomers of our past put in just to be wrong. What a pitiful end to it all. Or that's what Bellamy and by extension many of us would say. But it's in these delusional states of mind that humans are able to grasp at the impossible. 500 years ago we literally thought we were at the center of the universe and the thunder that we heard on rainy nights were the work of a god named Zeus and the moon was a deity in the distant sky, looming over and judging us like an all-seeing eye. But humans were able to land on that same moon with our own two feet, even though it wasn't as magical as Hevelius dreamed it would be. Is our tendency to imagine the unknown in spectacular ways pathetic since we expect too much of the world? Or is our hyper-imagination what drives us to find the answers even if it's not what we're looking for? In the lifetime of the entire human race, we probably won't discover intelligent life on other planets. The universe is just way too big and the speed of light is way too slow. But even if I'm grasping at straws believing in aliens in the sky, how can someone that doesn't believe in aliens accurately prove me wrong? When the giant ship fell from the sky in One Piece, the manga related a quote by a fictional scientist named Willie Gallen. Everything that humans can imagine can happen in reality.